Yes? No? There? There we go. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today. We had a wonderful morning. I think we had uh, a lot of information to process. We had some heartfelt stories that were told. I think I saw um, a lot of emotional people in the audience when we heard uh, from those participants in the Coalfields and Refresh program. And we're in for a wonderful jam-packed afternoon as well. So who said Friday afternoon is a, a quiet time? We're going to make the most of it. And we appreciate all of you who have come and who are staying through the duration. Um, on behalf of Jamie and the law school and myself and the Rockefeller School, we, we truly hope that this is the beginning of more conversations like this to come. So my name is Rochelle Goodwin, Rocky. Um, I am the Senior Associate Vice President for Academic and Public Strategy, which is a mouthful, but in part it means that I've had the pleasure this year of, among other things, helping with the launch of the Rockefeller School for Policy and Politics, and that's been a lot of fun. I'm also a graduate of this law school, which is also great. And in between those two endeavors, I've had a wonderful career of practicing law and managing our state pro bono program and spending almost a decade working on the staff of uh, United States Senator when Jay Rockefeller directing this. Well, I was serving on the staff um, during that time. And so it's my a special treat for me to be able to tell you a little bit about our keynote speaker today. I could spend this time going through a litany of mind-blowing accomplishments throughout a stellar five-decade career of public service that would really knock your socks off. But we would be here till Sunday, and I like you, and I want you to come back another time. So what I'll do is I'll give you a one-minute public service announcement. It is about a great opportunity in case you wanted to stop by before you leave town at our WISE library on the main campus. There's a Rockefeller gallery. It's the beautiful old facade of the original library. It has art deco um, architecture. And it is now filled with the first display of the Rockefeller Archives Legacy of Leadership. And it's a wonderful way to walk through some of the great accomplishments that we probably take for granted in our everyday lives that you may not know that Jay Rockefeller was the architect of that, uh, that benefit to all of us. So I recommend that to you. We'll also have the opportunity through the school moving forward to have lectures. We have our new Rockefeller School fellow, Jay Cole, will be joining us to do a series of lectures in the coming months and years uh, to really help us understand how politics and policy and West Virginia's history um, has played out during those five decades of service. So if you're interested in that, please let me know your email address and we'll put you on those lists to be sure that you're invited. So rather than going through the litany of accomplishments, I wanted to say, well, I, I will do that too. I wanted to say um, a, a, a couple quick stories that tell you a little bit about who Jay Rockefeller is and what makes him tick. Um, one of them, when we, I had a bunch of staff coming into the office and asking, did you see that movie, A Devil Wears Prada? And this was an unremarkable movie a long time ago. But the main character has a big fat briefing book every night. And her staff scurries around to make sure every single slip of detailed information is in that book every night. And guess what? I have a secret to tell you. Jay Rockefeller had one of those briefing books every night, too. Or two or three, and they were this thick, and they had every piece of information, every countervailing view, every chart, every graph, everything. And reliably, they would come back the next morning, and you'll see this when the archives are released, marked up, underlined, highlighted, questions circled, more work. He is a student of policy, right? But he's also a student of people. So he would pair that work with conversations almost every week with one, in one town or another across West Virginia in tables that were round with people who were on the front lines and experiencing what those policies were, how they were translating into real life. And he listened 
and he asked probing questions. And he learned. And then, and only then, was he ready to go back to Washington, D.C., armed with policy and understanding of people and cast a vote or draft a piece of legislation. And that connection to people was so strong that those who love him most and know him best once really wrestled with a decision about what to get him for a landmark birthday. His four children thought, you know, dad has everything that he needs, and if he doesn't have it, he can go buy it for himself, and what are we going to do to show that we know him, we love him, and we want to celebrate him? And do you know what they landed on? A really wonderful charcoal portrait of just the face of a miner, weathered, wrinkled skin, wearing his hard hat, staring stoically. And that portrait graced the walls of his United States Senate office from the moment he received it from his birthday until he closed the door for the very last time on that Senate office in January of 2015 when he retired. And whenever there was a difficult question, a policy issue that was complicated. Whenever there was some executive who really wasn't tied into the real life experiences of West Virginians, he would walk them over to the portrait and he would explain, this is who guides my every decision, my every press release, my every vote. The people are important. The people, the policy. And in some cases, like today, the puzzle that we have to work also includes more complicated pieces. So you have energy and environment and people and policy and politics, and you have to fit those pieces together. And I watched him work that puzzle for several years, and we're all working that puzzle today. And I know that we have commitment for not only everybody here as participants, but from West Virginia University. We have the president here, President Gee, we have President Gordon Gee, we have uh, Lori is here, we have um, the leadership of Eberly, of the law school, of the Reed School College of Media. We've got an all-in effort to solve that puzzle. So without further ado, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce to you one Senator John D. Rockefeller IV, a student of people and policy and an expert puzzle worker. Thank you, Rocky. All right, that's enough now. Um, I'm going to give a short speech. You've heard several of those today, have you none? You know, the amazing thing, we had all those speeches and we still ended at exactly 12 noon. It was remarkable. Rocky, did you do that too? Probably. Okay, <laughs> we're late. And I gotta go back to Washington. Um, so the, the, some of the key characters that I was gonna mention, I won't because they've been mentioned already and they've spoken and they've participated. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy about Rocky's introduction uh, because it's entirely true. <laughs> I absolutely loved my time in uh, the Senate. I loved my time as governor. I loved my time more in the Senate because the policy issues are more complex and they're deeper. And the staff, um, you know, everybody who graduates from Stanford or any other place, and they, they, want, they, want to go, they want to go be a staff on the Hill. And they just do, just endless amounts of really brilliant people. And, um, so you get, you, as governor, you, you're one of one, Senate, you're one of a hundred, but as governor, the things that you get to put your hands on and to change are of a smaller scale than if you do your work in the United States Senate. And I just have to say that because I wanted to. Because there are, four, there are 15 people in the Senate who were former governors, and they all said, oh, what I loved was being governor. And what my interpretation of that is they had a plane, they never had to do their laundry. They never had to drive. They got all their meals handed to them, and they had a nice big mansion to live in. Anyway, um, I was have, Jamie and Adele and I were, were talking uh, a while ago 
and we came upon a basic truth. And that is that researchers and scholars had really done a very thorough job of looking at the ins and outs of our environmental situation. And this was at, about, at a time when I was going to chair a commission which, and Chris Meyer is here. Aren't you, Chris? Yep. When I was going to chair, um, uh, made up of labor unions and, and the, the, always the heads of the labor unions and environmental groups. NRDC, the Sierra Club, there were, there were a bunch of them there. Um, and the point was they, that we all agreed that what we had to do was to find a way to make the current difficult situation for coal miners. In other words, those affected by the environment, not just those who were polluted by acid rain, but you know the whole the whole working process to give them some hope. And and uh, Kelly, you or Tom or you, Keith, spoke about that. Uh, the number of, the number of coal miners who used to work, and they don't now. But we what we also discovered is that there really had been relatively little work done on the effect of what might happen environmentally if this country takes action or more action on, um, on, the, and, on people, on people in southern West Virginia, northern West Virginia, and in general. There had not been that, that emphasis. And I've made it a rule in life, and Rocky sort of indicated that. When I, I constantly, in fact, I, in my farewell speech to the Senate, I, I said, that, you know, the key to being a good senator is to, whenever you're talking about public policy, see faces, see real faces of real people, and you, you talk about this, Adele, um, who you've worked with over the years, or you've come to know, who came up and tore you apart. But see faces. Policy is not abstract. It's not for the love of the game, so to speak. It's, it's, uh, it, it has effect on real people in ways which nobody can predict entirely. So President Guy and I got together, and, and uh, with his primary help, we started the School of, of Policy and Politics. It was the Rockford School. Of, uh, started out politics and policy. I said, no, that's got to be reversed. It's got to be policy and then politics, which helps make policy take place. And the point was that it had to be open, it had to be fearless, it had to be willing to take on any problem, no matter how hard, uh, relating to, I, I would say probably West Virginia, but you know, Appalachia in a broader sense. Um, and we've got one with the so-called, as you pointed out, the $80,000 coal miners in southern West Virginia who can't, you know, can't sell their house and, and all of that. Well, I, I was a VISTA for two years in 64 and 65, volunteers in service to America. And those two years changed me. Um, I was reborn. I was reborn. Because I had not exactly come from the circumstances of Emmons, West Virginia. But I wanted to know what those circumstances were. And it was um, a little bit like my grandfather when he went out to Ludlow after the Ludlow massacre. And he was president of the company. And he spent, he, he got Mackenzie King, who was the very liberal prime minister of Canada at the time, to be his mentor, how to handle the situation. He had never danced. He was a practicing Baptist, okay? He'd never danced. Well, he ended up dancing with all of these people, listening to their stories, coming to know them. And then he sat down and wrote the first compact between labor and management ever written. I gave one copy to Rich Trumka, and I keep the final copy for myself. In other words, he went through an epiphany. And he was in his 60s when all that happened. Um, there's just nothing like being a social worker. There's nothing like it. When you go to work every day knowing you're going to see the same people on Medicaid, um, some of them are going to be strung out on drugs, some of them are going to be doing alcohol, some of them are going across to Lincoln County to the 
Lincoln County uh, Health Center. Um, but they're all in trouble. They didn't have jobs when I was there. They don't have jobs today. They didn't have enough education when I was there. They, they, they don't have it today. They didn't have opportunity. And they sort of framed a view about life, which was not entirely positive for very understandable reasons. Well, it was very important for me to know that. Um, I got very good at what I call front porch sessions. I would go and I would sit on the front porch with them, sometimes in a swinging thing. And there are long silences. And you learn to love the long silences. That's when they were being them, trying to figure out what the heck I was doing in the place. <laughs> and part of it was just them reflecting on you know, possibilities they never had. And then when you had conversation, it was profoundly meaningful. And if you do that over a period of several years, uh, you come to know people so intimately, so intimately. For the first six months I was there, they wouldn't allow me inside their houses. And, but I was good with kids, and so one day I finally broke through, and I was invited to go have lunch, which I, since that was the only place I could eat was in somebody's house, I was starving, so I was very grateful. <laughs> so what we're about here is to own our challenges. We're charged with solving our challenges. We're charging ourselves. And this is a growing movement across West Virginia. West Virginia and West Virginians understand very clearly what needs to be done in this state. The question is, is there the will to do it? Is there the leadership to do it? Is there the legislature to do it? Uh, don't, please don't get me into the Congress of the United States and that situation. But the point is, everybody is hard cast, right, in their little ideological situation. And they speak to their own echo chambers. And do they become unoriginal and go outside of familiar? Like, you know, if you've got a Vietnam War going on, or you've got 9-11 going on, or you've got ISIL going on, um, you, you, you focus on those things. And that's important. But in the back of all of that, you have to be thinking about how some of these fighters from Afghanistan and Iraq and, and ISIL come back, how they come home, what they look like, what they feel like. And that's the whole question of veterans and how do we treat our veterans, which is a profoundly moving and, and wonderful story because we they get wonderful health care, but they don't get attention or they don't believe they get attention. And believing is more important than the fact. You know, people can believe in them, but if they, if they don't believe they do, then it doesn't help them. So we've learned today where the, where the numbers are for, on coal. And um, we've learned that it's not going to get better. We can go to a Republican administration or a Democratic administration. It isn't going to make a wits difference. Um, the EPA might be reined in a tiny bit by the Republican administration, but not really, because they'll be upheld by a lot of courts. And so nothing's going to change from the big picture, from the, uh, the big agencies. Um, so that's our job. We've got to boldly face the reality of the transition from where we are now to where we believe we ought to be, if we can figure that out. I think Tom Ewer, Keith, or you, Kelly, made that point this morning, that um, it, it, you're always on your way to something next. And you, Keith, pointed out that the person in southern West Virginia making $80,000 sees no reason to have to move at all. One, because he can't sell his house. Secondly, because where are you going to get $80,000? So then I go right back to, I, I worked for 10 years, uh, and I was 10 or 11 trips to Japan to try to bring the Toyota company to West Virginia. They weren't having no part of that. See, part of our problem, I think, is we stay too much within ourselves. We don't reach out to Europe. We don't reach out to Asia, to Taiwan, to China, Germany. We do know all that stuff now. Um, but they just didn't want to come. But I wouldn't give up. And he'd known my parents. My parents had known him. That helps a little bit. And so finally, he said, OK, I'll open up a factory for 300. 
that 300 is now, what, 1,000, 2,000, 2,000. And so there were 300 jobs available. They advertised. You know how many applications they got? 25,000. Okay, so some of them were from Ohio, some were from Kentucky. That makes sense. But the bulk of them were from West Virginia. Message, we want to work. That's called the value that people were talking about this morning. And when you work at Toyota, that's not easy. You're fiddling with engines. I mean, it's highly complex stuff. So I figured that these must be coal miners because they had been working with uh, coal mining machinery and continuous miners and all the rest of it. Um, than computers, and, the, and only three of them were. I researched that with David Copenhaver. I researched that, and only three were coal miners. And that set me to thinking, how is it that, that a coal miner can be attractive? That they were paying seventy dollars to $80,000 at Toyota. And start off, I have no idea what it is today, and I'd probably get thrown in jail for saying what I did. But how do you get people to rise out of their lifestyle, even though they can't save their house and sell it? And if you can't sell your house, is there a way that you can get an intermediary, a person of goodwill in the neighborhood or from somewhere else, to help you do it? In other words, we're such a close community. There has never been a closer sense of family and community than there is in the state of West Virginia. There's never. And see, that's value. That helps them work hard. That helps them keep their eye on the ball, provided that they get wages and you know, can, ha can have a house. So um, we had to lay off 70 teachers in a southern West Virginia. It was it Wyoming County? Boone. Um, 70 teachers. Why? Because. The money isn't coming in from coal. Well, so the money isn't coming in from coal. We can draw two conclusions from that. One is that we have been so coal dominated in our psychology, not just our economy, but in our psychology and in our politics, that people are afraid to speak out and to speak up. Try and find a whistleblower in a coal company. It, it, uh, they've got the law on their side, but they won't, won't necessarily keep their jobs. It's a very tough. You know, the man went to jail a couple of days ago. And that, that has just put a stamp on West Virginia where people are afraid. They are afraid. And you cannot be afraid if you want to have a future. And we can't be afraid on their behalf. So as Rocky said, these families, these people that I just spent so much time with, I, t I kept a diary. Every, every day, I, every night, I wrote extensively. And then I didn't read the diary for 50 years. And I can't figure out why. I think there's something sacred about it. And I finally did it. And I think Danielle has it now. It's in the, uh, in the library. Um, we've got the environment to worry about. We've got our economy to worry about. And we've got uh, people. Uh, to worry about. And how can we do it on all three fronts, for the short term, for the midterm, and for the long term? Nobody can predict what will happen. So out of that slim statement, I'm going to make another statement, that as we go through this process, let's not go through it grimly. Let's not be, we're going to solve those problems, because you won't to begin with right away. What you do is you, you surround yourself with hope, which is the most important word in the English language, as far as I'm concerned. Tom said this morning, you're an optimist. And you are. And you are. Um, you have to have hope. You have to be determined to help these people, and you have to be hopeful for that result, knowing that all kinds of blocks are in your, in your way. So maybe they get a good health. I mean, you know, the Affordable Care Act, I stuck in a $10 billion. I'm pretty proud of it. I don't know if it's still there. Um, I think it is. 
for 1,000 rural health clinics across the United States of America because I saw what the Boone County rural health clinic meant for Emmons, West Virginia, because that's where our people went to die, to get fixed up, or whatever. Um, again, closeness. You trust what's close to you. So we're here to take control of the future, to be resilient, to chart our path forward, and to do it very much with uh, the people that we're thinking about in mind. And they don't, hold, they don't have to be coal workers. They don't have to be from southern West Virginia. They can be all kinds of people. We're talking about a, a state writ large here. And there are lots of people, I think, who don't live up to their full potential because they're afraid sometimes to take the steps to do that. And which, if they did take those steps, they would do it very well. They would do it very well. There are all kinds of uh, young groups around West Virginia. They call them Generation Charleston, Generation Morgantown. And they're made up of people, I think it's 30 or less, 35 or less. And they meet on a regular basis, and they're all over the place, and they talk about the future. What do we have to do to make our future better? They do that on their own. They're not chartered to do that. They just do that. They're hopeful, and hope motivates them. So we need to help. Uh, we need to understand. Um, we need to understand people who live both in poverty and are ashamed of it, or are on welfare and are ashamed of it, or who do that and drink some and are ashamed of it, or who don't have teeth and are ashamed of that, but who underneath are rock solid good people, given some hope, given some hope. So part of our dialogue in all of this, I think, has to be based upon a sense of hope. We know things are going to be hard. Obviously, they're going to be hard. I mean, do you, everybody says diversify the economy. That's a very hard thing to do. I, I tried to get Toyota to go down to southern West Virginia to go to Beckley. But they, there was a wonderful industrial park there. But they had an I-64 complex. They needed to be close to I-64. But that problem of getting 50 acres that you mentioned in, in West Virginia and southern West Virginia is really a problem. It's really hard, hard to overcome. So what do we do to make up for that? I remember going up to the Eastern Panhandle. I, I met with a number of people who were sort of growing food commercially. And I particularly remember one guy was building, was growing, um, not turnips, but uh, well, let's just say turnips, on a very steep slope where just looking at it, it couldn't be done. But he was doing it because that's all he had. And he and his partners were making money. Small little business going on up there, and they were making money. And that's a good place to do business. So um, I, I just I beg for your patience. I beg that all of us will shed these practices of, of um, only listening to the silos that we live in ideologically, and, and then the echo chambers that follow from that, so you can't have a conversation. You have to line up. You're on this side or that side, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, pro-growth, life comes as it is. And if you line up, and that's what's happened in this presidential election, which is why I simply can't stand it. I can barely, I can barely make myself watch MSNBC, much less Fox because they're just running the same thing. Do they talk about policy? Never. Only when Bernie or Hillary get into something. Do they talk about who got who? Gotcha. And they're the big leagues, but they can't get outside of themselves. They can't, they're not helping anybody, and yet everybody watches them. So that uh, when I, I, and I really am very, am, insisted on this, that we don't be too grim about it. We do our work, we do it, we get the work done that we have to do, the scholarship and the rest of it. But we're not going to be grim, we're going to be hopeful. Because people read that body language, and we read it from each other. 
And that's one of the reasons Gordon Gee is so successful. Or the former Gordon Gee, is he still there? Yes, that's one of the reasons you're so successful. You're always optimistic, you're always can do. And then you, after you say, yes, we'll do that, sometimes you'll move a little bit away, but you've left the person with hope, if not a second appointment with you. <laughs> you see, I mean, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to watch. And that's where you get big ideas, and that's where the school of big ideas come from. That's a classic Gordon Gee. So let's, um, let's do this stuff, okay? I owe these communities everything uh, for molding me into who I hope uh, I am. And I very much want to join with all of you who are standing up and blazing our trail forward, and I think we ought to get started, and we are starting. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Senator. I think we're going to try to stay on schedule and make up for lost time. So if you wouldn't mind making our way back to the other room, we'll continue our program for this afternoon.